Heavenly Father, we thank you just for another beautiful day. You keep giving them to us. And just the joy of being able to worship you and to hear from you this evening. Lord, we look forward to the lessons you're going to show us. Lord, just prepare our hearts. Keep our minds focused upon you. And as always, Lord, as we worship you, we want to be drawn into your very presence. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9 as we continue our study through the Word of God. And keep in mind that Paul is writing to Jewish Christians who were living in Jerusalem, and they were really struggling with their faith. They were being drawn back into the legalism of Judaism. And because of that, Paul is making this powerful point, showing them that Jesus is better than the prophets, better than the angels, better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He's better than the Levitical priesthood, and all of them went with it. Now, again, Paul's not putting these people down. He's not putting down the prophets or angels or Moses or any of the others. He's just showing us that Jesus is superior. And when you think about it as these men were magnified, it only makes Jesus even more superior. And I truly believe that Hebrews chapters 5 through 10 are really the pinnacle of Paul's letter. And the reason I say that is because Paul, or the Jews, held the Levitical priesthood, the tabernacle and later the temple, in high esteem, and all the sacrifices that went along with it. And to show them that Jesus is superior to all this, as great as they were, he's going to have to prove to them step by step. And that's exactly what he does. You know, he started out um, in this section uh, of Jesus being superior over the Levitical priesthood in chapters 5 through 7, that Jesus is from a better priestly order, from the order of Melchizedek, you know, not the order of Aaron. It was an eternal priesthood. It never ends. Well, then in Hebrews chapter 8, we saw that Jesus has a better covenant for us, a new covenant that does more than deal with the outward ceremonial cleansings, it deals with the heart. It deals with us inwardly, and that covenant was made by the shedding of his blood once for sin. And if you remember how Paul closed out Hebrews uh, chapter 8 last time, he showed them in us by saying this. In that, he says, Jesus says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. In other words, that old covenant that dealt with the keeping of the law and the sacrifices were only temporary until the Messiah came. Now that the Messiah is here, the old covenant is done away with, and we have the new covenant that's seen in the shed blood of Christ for our sins. You know, he, he closed by saying, not what is becoming obs- now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. You think, well, what is he talking about? He's speaking of the temple and all the sacrifices that went along with it. And keep in mind that when Paul wrote this letter to the Hebrews, the destruction of the temple was getting closer, maybe some four to six years away at this point. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple occurred in 70 AD when Titus and the Roman army came in, destroyed the city, burned the temple to the ground, and all the gold with it burned. And to get to the gold, they had to, you know, turn over the stones and That's exactly what Jesus said would take place in Matthew chapter 24. Not a stone would be left. And there is even evidence today of those stones that were thrown down from the temple. They're still there. So when Paul wrote, now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away, he's speaking not only of the temple, but all that went with it, what went with it. All the sacrifices, the old covenant has been replaced by the new covenant. Now for some 1,900 years, over 1,900 years, the temple's been gone. There's no grain or animal sacrifices. And tonight, we're going to see Paul show us that Jesus is a better sanctuary, which again was very important to the Jews. And what I hope you see is that what the temple and the tabernacle represented was fulfilled in Christ. It was a picture of him. We see the person and the work of Jesus in his earthly ministry through all of this. And that should just make sense to us. I mean, remember what we're told in Psalm 40, verse 7, and Paul repeats it in Hebrews. Behold, I come in the scroll of the book that is written of me. Of who? Of Jesus. 
from Genesis through Malachi in reality, for us even through the New Testament, it's all about Jesus. I mean, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, what is it? It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. You know, we think about the book of Revelation as being about the Antichrist or the one world government, the one world religion, this and that, these judgments that are coming. No, it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. He's coming back. In fact, John said, or Jesus said in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but it is these that, which testify of me. So don't miss the main point when you're reading the scriptures. They're pointing to Jesus, and Paul is really going to drive home that point here tonight as we dig into Hebrews chapter 9. So let's pick up Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. Paul wrote this, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, and which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Again, for the Jews, you know, the tabernacle and then later on the temple were very, very important to them. And even today we see that kind of two extremes regarding the tabernacle and I think we could relate it to the temple as well. Some say, well, it was meaningless. It's worthless. Um, the other end of the spectrum, it's everything. You know, we need that. That's why we're, the Jews are trying to rebuild it. They need the temple for the sacrifices. Now, I don't want to offend anyone, but both those views are really wrong. Was the tabernacle important? Yeah, but it was only a picture of what was to come and what the throne of God was like. In Exodus 25, verses 8 through 9, we're told, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. See, God instructed Moses how this tabernacle was to be built. He gave Moses the blueprints to follow exactly. Now think about this. There's two chapters really devoted to the creation story, right? Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And as great as that is, amazing as it is, there's 50 chapters focused on the tabernacle. And the majority of it is found in Genesis 25 through 40. Why was God so detailed about this tabernacle? Well, I think it's important, and it kind of fits with the point that Paul's making in this chapter. The reason it's so detailed, because it was a type, a picture of Jesus who was to come. And it's an amazing picture the Lord has painted for us, and we'll look at that some tonight in our study. Now, here's the thing. Don't miss the point, because it's important. Once the substance has come, you don't need the picture anymore, right? That should just make sense to us. Too often, people go back to the picture. But... What good is the picture? Can you hold on to the picture? No. Well, I guess you can. You can put it in your wallet. But isn't the reality of the person much better? I mean, think about it. I have a picture of Julie in my wallet. I have several pictures of her in my wallet. As great as those pictures are, I'd rather be with her. Sorry. That's just the reality. I want the substance. I want the person And that should be our heart's desire with Jesus, right? Don't we want him? Isn't that what it's all about? Absolutely. And you can look in our Exodus studies. We're just going to briefly look at this here because the picture is amazing. It really is. I mean, and I'll try and give you some insight to it. You know, the tabernacle itself was a giant tent. This is what was built during their wilderness wanderings. The courtyard was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and there was only one gate that you could enter through located on the east side, some 30 feet wide and seven and a half feet wide. So how is Christ a picture of the tabernacle? Well, first of all, John tells us in John 1.14, the word became flesh and dwelt 
or really literally tabernacled among us. In other words, God pitched his tent among us just as the tabernacle was a tent in which God dwelt. I mean, you think about it, in the New Testament, do we ever see the Shekinah glory in the temple? No. But the Shekinah glory was there in the presence and the person of Jesus Christ. And there is only one way to get into the tabernacle. And that was through an opening, always facing east, 30 feet wide, like I said, with a woven linen tapestry covering the entrance, was made of blue, spoke of divinity, purple, royalty, scarlet, blood, embroidery. One door in, and doesn't that sound familiar, right? It should, because there's only one door, one way to enter into heaven, and that's through the door, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 10, I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. And John 10, 1, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. So if you don't enter through the door, Jesus Christ, you're a thief and a robber because you're trying to attain something that's not yours. And you're not going to enter that way. You can only enter through the door, Jesus Christ. You know, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I think that's really, really clear. There is no other way. Well, I guess there is one other way. And I know, wow, what, what is he going to say? Think about it. If you were perfect, without sin, from the time of conception to the time of your death, you had no sin, I guess you could do it. How many of you have never sinned before? And if you raise your hand, you're a liar and you just sinned, so you blew it, right? Thus, we need the way, Jesus Christ, to enter in. There is no other way. And now, as you keep moving into the tabernacle, you pass the bronze altar. That's where the sacrifices were made. And the idea here is that before you could have fellowship with God, your sin had to be atoned for, and that atonement was done through the shedding of blood. Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And we even see it in the New Testament even here in Hebrews. We'll get to this next time, but in Hebrews 9, 22, it says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. The Old Testament sacrifices could never take away your sins. They covered them until you sinned again. But in the New Testament, we're taught, told that Jesus is the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. Wow. So from there now, from the brazen altar of sacrifice, just behind it and in front of the tabernacle proper was the bronze laver. This is where the priests would wash themselves after the sacrifices were made. I think, well, what's the picture of that? Some say, well, it represents baptism, and I don't think it does. If the brazen altar is where the sacrifices were made, and it's a picture of our salvation, the laver represents the word of God, and we are to wash daily in the word of God for sanctification and fellowship with the Lord. You know, Paul in Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. In Psalm 119, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that's the labor where they washed. As you continue to move forward, now you come to the temple proper. This structure was 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. And within this section was the holy place that was 30 feet long and 15 feet wide, and only the priests could enter the holy place. And as they entered, they would see three things. On their left side, before that veil, before that curtain, stood a seven-branched oil-burning lamp. Think about that. What did John say in John 1, verses 4 and 5? In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And, that, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus is the light of the world. 
Think about it. John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. This is a seven-branched oil-burning lamp. What is six a picture of? Man, incompleteness. And seven is the number of Christ who's complete. And thus, these six branches of this lamp were tied into the main one, or the seven. Well, that's what Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm the one where you get all your life from. Yeah. Then, on the right side was the table of showbread. Twelve loaves of bread that represented the twelve tribes of Israel. And again, this is kind of easy here. Jesus said that I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And the third piece of the furniture in the holy place was in the center, and it was the altar of incense. And it's where the priest would burn incense to the Lord, and I think it's a picture of our prayers. You know, Psalm 141, 2. Let my prayers be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. This altar of incense goes up before God. Now, I don't think the altar of incense was in the Holy of Holies. I think the censer was in the Holy of Holies. The high priest would take some of the incense, the coals, the incense, bring it into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. It would make no sense to have the altar of incense in the Holy of Holies. Why? Because you can't attend to it. You couldn't go in there. You just couldn't go in there and clean things up. You could, only the high priest could enter once a year. So that wouldn't make any sense. So I think it was the uh, censer that that's talking about. Now, here's this big veil. The vi- this big veil separated the holy place from the Holy of Holies. And as you enter this room, it was 15 feet by 15 feet. This is the place where the Shekinah glory dwelt, the presence of God. And it's kind of interesting. If you look at the covering of this, there's either dolphin or badger skins on the top. And you think, well, man, you've got this beautiful tabernacle. And... The presence of God is in there, and it's covered with you know, badger skins or dolphin skins, whatever it was. It's not very attractive. You know what that reminds me of? The Lord. He didn't have any beauty. He looked just like everyone else. There was nothing that drew you to him. You know, you see someone like, you know, John Wayne. Some of you don't even probably know who John Wayne is. But John Wayne, you know, people were drawn to him because he was this good-looking guy, tough guy. Jesus was just your average guy. No form of comeliness. And so here, as you enter, the high priest would enter, the Holy of Holies. You'd see the Ark of the Covenant there. And it was a box made of acacia wood, overlaid with gold, measuring three feet by nine uh, inches long, and two feet, um, three inches wide, and two feet high. And in the ark were the tablets of the law, a jar of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Now, let me add this so there's no confusion. Approximately 500 years later, King Solomon completed his temple, right? Tabernacle's gone. In that, it was then that the ark um, didn't have all those implements. Um, in fact, 1 Kings 8 9 says there was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. I well, think what happened to Aaron's rod that budded in the golden pot of manna? We don't know. We don't know when they were removed, but they weren't there in the Ark of the Covenant in Solomon's temple, except the tablets of stone. Now, Paul's speaking of the tabernacle. That's why it's included here in Hebrews, because that's what was there, okay? He's not talking about the temple here. So just so that clarifies that, so there's no confusion. You had the Ark of the Covenant, right? This box, wooden box, covered with gold. On top of it was the mercy seat. And you could see it right over there on that picture. There's the two cherub facing each other. 
on the top of the mercy seat. And we're told that God dwelt above the mercy seat, his Shekinah glory. Exodus 25, 22 says, uh, the Lord said this, There I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. Isn't it interesting? God doesn't meet us upon the law which condemns us. He meets us upon the mercy seat. And this is where the high priest would sprinkle the blood of, on the day of atonement. So what did the blood do? It covered the law. And God can have mercy on us because our sins have been covered by the blood. And Jesus has paid in full. His blood has taken away our sins. In fact, it's interesting, in 1 John 2, 2, John says, And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. The Amplified Bible puts it like this. And he, that same Jesus himself, is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours alone, but also for the sins of the whole world. John is saying that Jesus is our propitiation, or really, and this blows me away, or mercy seat. You see, the Septuagint, or the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures, uses that same Greek word that John used, helasmos, for mercy seat, in Exodus 25, 17. Again, that's what John used here in 1 John 2, 2. And again, you know, I guess Paul's point is not to give every detail of the tabernacle here. He's given, the Jews should have known this. They were brought up with this. But that's why I said, if you want more information on what all these, how these were a picture of Christ, go back to our, our studies in Exodus. And I, I did go over those uh, pretty deeply on those. These are just pictures of Christ. And Paul's going to show them really the, limitations of the earthly service of the priest and what their service pointed to. Again, it's always pointing to Jesus. That's what he's trying to do. Okay, this is what the earthly priest did. This is what the early tabernacle, this is what it was about. But it's a picture. Look to the substance now. Look at verse 6. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So once the tabernacle was set up, the priest's work began, and it never ended, really. Every day the priest went into the holy place to perform their duties, tending to the oil-burning lamp by trimming the wicks, adding oil to the lamp. They never had a day off. They always had to do sacrifices. And with the altar of incense, they'd have to add the coals and the incense to it. Each week on the Sabbath, they had to change the loaves of bread on the table of showbread. And that was just in the holy place. Their work never ended. But that was not the end of it. You see, that was what took place in the holy place. But behind the veil, in the holy of holies, only the high priest could enter, and only once a year on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. So think about it. You know, we have access to God. Our fellowship with God, we can boldly go through his, to his throne of grace, right? They couldn't. They didn't have access to that. Their fellowship with God was severely restricted, even for the high priest. I, to me, it wasn't really a fellowship with God that they enjoyed as they went into the Holy of Holies. They couldn't sit down with God and talk with him. Why? Because sin separated man from God. In fact, the ancient Jewish rabbis wrote of how the high priest did not prolong his prayer in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. The reason being is the people might think he was dead. Remember, he went on with bells on his robe and a rope around his leg because if the bell stopped ringing, he was dead. And no one was going to go in there and get him. So they would pull him out. And when he came out from the Holy of Holies, 
He threw a party for all his friends. Why? Because he emerged safely from the presence of God. That's kind of funny to me. I made it! Woo! You know, I don't know. It's just, that was the relationship with God. And again, like we've said so often, these sacrifices never cleansed the person inwardly. It was outwardly. It was a ceremonial cleansing. And here was the problem for the Jewish people. They knew when they sinned that they needed to offer a sacrifice for their sin. But what about sins of ignorance? How do you atone for them? What about those sins you committed and you weren't even aware that you committed them? And over time, you can imagine how they could accumulate. What was done for that? Well, that was really the Day of Atonement. It wasn't just for your all sins. These were for sins of ignorance, mostly. And yes, um, it was for all sin, but this was specific also for the sins of ignorance. One writer put it like this. He said, The Day of Atonement is a holy day established by God for the people of Israel. Biblically, Yom Kippur was to provide an atonement, literally a covering for sin. For the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, for the tabernacle itself, for the altar of incense in the holy place, for the priests including the high priest, and for the sins committed in ignorance by the people of Israel. Yom Kippur was divinely ordained because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression in all their sins. An everlasting statute, it was the once-a-year awe-inspiring zero hour for an impure nation, a nation that was required to stand clean before its holy God. If you want, you can turn to Leviticus 16. I'm just going to share a little bit about what this day was like. We're going to look at verses 29 through 34 in Leviticus chapter 16. But listen to what this was about. We're told, This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year, as he did as the Lord, and they did as the Lord commanded Moses. Wow. Aren't you glad that Jesus finished the work? Look at all that went on. And I think it's important for us to understand that. Because then when we see what Christ has done for us, it blows us away. I mean, during the time of Jesus, the high priest would spend the week before Yom Kippur on the temple grounds going over what he was going to do, preparing himself for the day. And then on the day, he would ceremonially cleanse himself, put on his high priestly robes, the breastplate with the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And it was close to his heart. He was showing that he held the nation close to his heart before the Lord. He had the linen ephod on, and on the ephod there were 12 stones on his shoulders representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and it showed that he was carrying the nation before God on his shoulders. And then he had to offer a sacrifice for his sins. And before he did this, he took the coals from the bronze altar where the sacrifices were made, put them into a gold censer with incense, and brought it into the Holy of Holies before the Lord. And then he came out, sacrificed a bullock, and another priest collected the blood from the sacrifice. Some of it was placed in a small bowl, carried into the Holy of Holies, and then sprinkled on the mercy seat seven times. And he didn't linger long in there. You know, the people listened for those bells to continue ringing. And as he came out, they breathed a sigh of relief. God accepted the offering. And he wasn't done. He had to offer the blood for the sins of the nation, for the people. 
And when he came out of that whole, the Holy of Holies, there's two goats waiting for him at the bronze altar. One of them would be written for Yahweh, the other for Aziel, or the scapegoat. And to determine which one was which, the high priest would cast lots from, and from these lots they would determine which one would be used for the scapegoat and which one was for the Lord, which one was going to be sacrificed. So in a small urn, the two lots were placed, and as each one was drawn, it was tied to the horn of one of the goats. The goat that was for Yahweh was slaughtered on the altar, and its blood was caught the same way as a, the bullock and swished into a bowl and carried into the Holy of Holies. The blood of the goat then was sprinkled on the mercy seat once again, but again, not for the high priest this time. This is for the people, and he didn't spend much time in there. For as he, as a, as a Azel, I can't even say it, or scapegoat, the hands of the high priest would be placed on the head of this animal, and then the sins of the people were confessed over them. After that, the goat was taken out in the wilderness and turned loose to be lost and never to return. In Fawcett's Bible Dictionary, this is what they wrote about it. The lots were first of boxwood, laterally of gold, put into an urn, into which he put both his hands and took out a lot in each. While the two goats stood before him, one on the right, the other on the left, the lot in each hand belonged to the corresponding position. When the lot for the scapegoat was in the right, it was a good omen. He then tied a tongue-shaped piece of scarlet cloth on the scapegoat. The Gemara says that the red cloth ought to turn white as a token of God's acceptance or the atonement which illustrates Isaiah 118, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. No such change took place for 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem, a singular testimony from Jewish authority to Messiah, as his ministry was precisely 40 years before the destruction of the holy city. The type ceased when the anti-type came. And I find that interesting, you know. And supposedly that, that scarlet cord turned white, but after Jesus came, it didn't. Why? Because the sins were paid for by Jesus. The picture is gone. You know, you could send that scapegoat out into the wilderness, having all the sins cast upon it, right? Could it come back? I guess so. You know, there's stories of what? Different animals, you know, you take them out, leave them somewhere, and they come back home. Amazing. Now, people have done that with, um, with squirrels and rabbits. You know, they get them out of their yard, they catch them in a cage, and they take them down to the forest preserve or something, and before I know it, the squirrels are back again. Well, this goat could come back too. When Jesus paid for our sins, he cast our sins as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. That is an amazing thing to me. It, it kind of boggles the mind because, you know, we all struggle with that. We all think, you know, oh, man, I blew it. God doesn't love me. How could he love me? Look at me. Look at what I did. And if you had a chance to go up into heaven and say, you know, what do, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm sure... I went way too far this time. You know what Jesus would say? You know what the Father would say? There is no record of your sins. Why? Because they've been paid in full, not partial. I mean, if our sins were paid partially by Jesus, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? Yeah. Hebrews 9.14 how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What Jesus has done is far greater than what has been done on the day of atonement by the high priest. It's completely sufficient. In fact, we're told that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father because the work was done. No further sacrifices needed. The priest never sat down. There was always work to do. I mean, can you imagine on the Day of Atonement or even Passover? Let's use Passover as an example. 
all the sacrifices that were being made. And from the temple where these sacrifices were slaughtered, there was this little causeway where the blood flowed and it went down into the Kidron Valley. And I, I, I find that amazing because remember when Jesus went the, up the Mount of Olives? The Lamb of God who was going to be sacrificed had to pass through the brook Kidron where all that blood was flowing. Wow. What a picture. Look at verse 8. Here in Hebrews 9, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. You know, we see many today trying to apply the old covenant together with the new covenant and they don't mix. In fact, the old covenant had to pass away before God's new covenant could be revealed. Think of the covenant as a will and testament. Say I write out a will and testament, right? It's all done, you know, stamped, everything's good. In a few years, I'm going to change my will. So I write out a new will, get it all notarized, all stamped, everything is good. What happens to the old one? It's done away with. It's gone. You don't take, you don't say, well, I've got the new one, but yeah, there's this old one here too. So let's try and look at both of them. Well, no, they're different. They're not the same. This is why I wrote the new one. If they were the same, I would have never wrote a new one. That's the old covenant and the new covenant. They don't mix at all. Paul in verse 8 here said that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. We could not enter the presence of God until a complete atonement for our sin was made. And that was done by Jesus. And I think there's a couple of points we need to look at. First of all, the Holy Spirit is showing us that an intimate relationship with God was limited in the Old Covenant. And we've seen that. Well, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, and only once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and only for a short time. The second point I think that the Holy Spirit is showing us is that their sins were never forgiven. Yeah, the scapegoat was let go, like I said. He traveled in the wilderness, but again, he could come back. There's no guarantee, and it was only a picture. And these sacrifices were not only made once a year on the Day of Atonement, but every day sacrifices were being made because, as we're going to see next time, that our salvation, and I'll just share verses 12 through 15 in Hebrews 9, that our salvation is not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Absolutely. And we'll look at that more next time. The third point I think that the Holy Spirit is teaching us is that the old covenant with the sacrificial system was only temporary. They needed to be repeated over and over again, as I said, daily sacrifices. And so the old covenant's limited. It was incomplete. There was no access into the presence of God because sin separated man from God. That's what the veil was all about. It was a vivid reminder. And if you think about it, only the priest could enter the holy place and only the high priest into the holy of holies. There was the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the court of the men, 
the court of the priest, which was in the holy place, and the holy of holies, all separating man from God. Sin does that. And I realize people today have a hard time with that, even in churches today. They don't like to talk about sin. They, they feel that that's too negative. Yeah, it is negative. It's bad. It's horrible. Sin is horrible. But we got to deal with it, right? Isaiah 59. The Lord's hand is not shorn that he cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. There's the problem. Sin separates. And that gap is too wide for man to cross over. You need a mediator. You need a bridge builder. You need Jesus. He's the mediator between God and man. He's the one who brings us to the Father. And so the old covenant was temporary until the new covenant can come. Look at, look at Hebrews 8 for a second. We're going to pick up in verse 6 and go down to verse 13 of Hebrews 8. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I make with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. He says, A new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Absolutely. You know, the Jews should have known this. This was Paul's quoting out of Jeremiah. The new covenant. But they held on to their Jewish traditions so much that even when the Messiah came, they didn't see him. And people do that all the time today. You know, I came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And, you know, it's really, really interesting because you could talk about, you know, the Pope, you could talk about priests, you could talk about saints, you could talk about Mary, you can talk about all kinds of things with Catholic people. But start talking about Jesus, and they're offended. Well, I, don't, I don't want to hear about that. Well, wait a minute. Isn't it all about Jesus? You see, their religious traditions have kept them from the Messiah, just like with the Jewish people. Like I said, Jesus said, you search the scriptures, talking to the religious leaders. For in them you think you have life, but the, these are they which testify of me. But they refused to see that they didn't want to come to him. And that's the tragedy with so many religions today. They missed the main point. It's all about Jesus. And if there's a new covenant, that means what? The old covenant has to be gone. And they missed it because tradition superseded the word of God. Does it happen today? It absolutely does. Absolutely. Now, I realize some don't see this as symbolic. What does Hebrews 9.9 9 say? It was symbolic. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great teacher, right? I just read what it says. It was symbolic. It's a picture. It's a, just something set side by side to make a comparison. And there are beautiful pictures that emerge from the tabernacle about Jesus. But the substance is here. Don't focus on the pictures. Focus on the person. Focus on Jesus.
we talked about this before, but think about the Jews today, pretty much the Orthodox Jews, because most Jews are, don't believe in the God of Israel at all. But the Orthodox Jew definitely does, and they want to rebuild the temple. But they've been without a temple, without sacrifices for almost 2,000 years. That should be a huge problem, right? How do you atone for sins? What happens on the Day of Atonement? There's no temple. There's no holy of holies. There's no mercy seat. In fact, there was no mercy seat at the time of Jesus either. There was no Ark of the Covenant. Well, for today, on the Day of Atonement, it's become a day of reflection. And you reflect on the good and bad things that you've done throughout the year. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, well, then you're forgiven for another year. So prior to the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, you do a lot of good deeds, right? You want to tip the scales in your favor. So you do a lot of good deeds, you know? Even if the little old lady doesn't want to go across the street, you're going to take her because you want that good deed, whatever. What is the problem with that kind of teaching? Think about that. What is the problem with your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds? Well, there's a huge one. There's none good, now, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that's a pretty big problem. So having a day of reflection, good deeds outweighing your bad deeds, is a false statement. It's a false doctrine. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. That's why the Jews today, the Orthodox Jews, are so focused on rebuilding the temple. Because I think they know in their hearts they need it. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The problem is this temple is not of God that they're going to rebuild. Because the sacrifice has already been made by Jesus. And they will see that, I believe, during the tribulation period where the nation of Israel gets saved. Every single Jew, I don't believe so, but a large portion of the Jewish people. We look at that and we kind of laugh, how could they do that? But how many people today feel the same way? Are you going to heaven? Well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I've done a lot of good things in my life. And, you know, I think when I get together with God, we'll talk about this. But I think, you know, I've done enough good things that God will accept me. Well, that's a crazy way to think of it, okay? Imagine if you get pulled over for speeding and the officer is going to give you a ticket and you want to go to court to fight it. Crazy. And you talk to the judge, okay? Say, you know, honor, yeah, I was going 100 miles an hour, and the speed limit was 20. A little bit high, I know. But, your honor, this is my first ticket in all my life. First one. I've been good all my life. So, all the good I've done has to account for something, right? And he would say, son, the law has no forgiveness. The law has no mercy. All it can do is show you that you broke the law. It doesn't matter how good you are. You broke the law, pay the fine, next. That's the problem. Now, are there police officers that show mercy? Yeah, sometimes they'll give you a warning. You know, several years ago, I made a turn left into the right-hand lane. And you can't, you're supposed to turn left in the left lane. And he pulled me over. He was at Pizza Hut. Got me right away. He showed me grace. And he didn't give me the ticket, or mercy. He didn't give me the ticket. He could have. And he should have. Because why? Because the law says, you broke the law, you're guilty. That's the problem for man. His sin has separated him from God. And if God ignores man's sin, then God's not righteous. 
He's unrighteous. There's darkness in him. And yet the Bible says there is no darkness in God. So he can't ignore sin. So what does God do? As he sends his only son to pay for our sins. Pay the debt that we owed for our sins. He took the punishment that we were to receive. And now God can forgive us of our sins because the debt was paid by Jesus for us. That, again, blows me away. Think about it. Okay, if, if Jesus only died for my sins, that still would be bad. Okay? All the things he would have to suffer. But he died for every single person on this planet. He took their sins. He took their punishment. I don't even get that. I don't even understand how that could be. Now, doesn't mean all are saved. They have to receive that pardon, that free gift. But all who do will enter into eternity with him. It's a free gift. It's not by works. It's not because I'm so good. Really, Jesus came because I'm so bad. <laughs> Paul in Romans 4, speaking about the faith of Abraham. Again, Old Testament, right? The faith of Abraham. Verses 2 through 8. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So both Abraham and David talked about righteousness. It was about their faith. And God blessed them because of their faith, not because of their works. If it was because of Abraham's works, then God owed him something. He was a debtor to Abraham, but he wasn't. Well, someone will say, yeah, but look at what Abraham did. He was going to offer his son as a sacrifice, just like God said. That's good works. No, that's, that is just the evidence of his faith. You think about it. God told Abraham that he was going to have a son, and it would, his, his descendants would be like the stars of heaven, like the, sands on the sand on the seashore. And then God says, go offer him as a sacrifice. He waited 100 years for the kid, right? He was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And then now he's probably, Isaac is probably like 30 years old. Really? You want me to offer my son? And Abraham did. And he didn't know what God was going to do. But he knew that God could raise him if he needed to. And so he walked by faith. We as Christians do good works, not for salvation, but evidence for our faith. That's what, you know, Hebrews chapter 11, that great hall of faith is all about. These are men and women of faith, okay? Not of works. Yeah, but it talks about all the things that they did. Yeah, that was what was manifested in their life because of their faith in God. And the same is true for us. We need to understand that. The, these Old Testament saints were never saved by their works. They're saved by faith, and really faith in the coming Messiah. We look back at the finished work of the Messiah. They looked ahead. Imagine that same court case. And this time you have a lawyer with you. You're not by yourself. And as the charges are read, as the prosecutor is ready to prove his point, your lawyer says to the judge, hi, dad. It's always a good way to start out, right? Judge is your dad. I've paid the price for his fee for breaking the law. It's taken care of. It's paid in full. And what would the judge say? Case dismissed. It's been paid for. 
That's what Jesus has done for us. He's paid in full the penalty for our sins, and the Father accepts it in case dismissed. Paul in Galatians 2.16 said, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Wow. I mean, I don't know how much clearer that could be. And there are some prominent people, some Christians, that have gotten into this that breaks my heart. I'm talking about people that have um, news feeds and, and all kinds of things. They've got into this whole Hebrew roots thing, and yet one verse destroys it, right? They don't care. They ignore it. We don't understand that. Well, for by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. It's simple. It's not going to happen. God has done an amazing thing in our lives. Paul talked about it in Ephesians 2, that he made us alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Can you imagine? Dead, spiritually speaking, we couldn't communicate with God. We're dead. And once you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. We walked aimlessly through life. Look at people today. They have no direction. They have no hope. That was all of us. And then Christ got a hold of our hearts and changed everything. You see, it's out of all that that Paul begins in verse 4 of Ephesians 2 with two words, but God. Changed everything, man. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith in that, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But God. Let me just share this with you. It kind of gives us a picture of this whole, of what God has done. We're told against the hopeless backdrop of man's sin and failure, Paul writes these words which are like the rays of the sun piercing the blackness of a terrible storm. But God, after lowering us deeper and deeper into the pit of hopelessness and despair by reminding us of our predicament, how that we were separated from God by Adam's sin, we were the slaves of the devil and doomed to spend eternity apart from God in hell, Paul suddenly takes us from the pit of despair and skyrockets us to the heights of absolute joy by proclaiming, but God, God intervened, God came to our rescue. But God is the answer to the greatest dilemma the human race has ever faced. How can a holy and righteous God who cannot bear to look upon sin ever have fellowship with sinners and allow them into heaven? But God is where life, real life, eternal life begins. I've made a mess out of my life. I've hit the bottom. I've tried to change to live a good life, but I keep falling back into the same old habits. I can't change. But God has promised that through his son, he can change me and give me a new life. But God is the solution to any problem we face in life. My marriage is so bad that it seems hopeless, but God can fix it. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I've just been told that my company has to lay me off and with the economy as bad as it is, I don't know where, know who's going to hire me or how I'm going to provide for my family. But God has promised to take care of me and my family because I am his child. I have been diagnosed with terminal cancer. The doctors say there is nothing left that they can do. It's hopeless. But God can heal me, and if he chooses not to, he can take me to heaven to be with him forever. 
The atheist doesn't say, but God. He defiantly rails, no God. There is no God but man, or there is no God but science, or there is no God but human government, or modern medicine, or whatever. The moralist and religionist doesn't say, but God. He confidently cries, and God. It is me, my goodness, and my religious works, and God. But like Paul, all true Christians shout, but God. It was helpless and without hope. In this, I was helpless and without hope in this world, but God came to my rescue. Absolutely. That's really the theme of the entire Bible, if you think about it. God created, created the heavens and the earth. You know, two chapters, a couple pages. And what's next? God redeeming sinful man. Adam sins, God's got to fix it now. And he does. We're going to finish up next time. As we look at Jesus being this better sanctuary, there's a lot of stuff here in, in Hebrews chapter 9. and um, We'll take our time going through it, obviously. But think about this, and this is from Hebrews 7.25, where Paul wrote, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Oh, you know, may we never lose sight or lose hope or go back to the type back to the symbols or the pictures instead of the substance Jesus Christ he has so much for us and he wants that intimate relationship with us and all you have to do is talk to him I don't care where you're at you could be driving in your car don't close your eyes when you're talking to him when you're in your car unless you stop but you could talk to him anywhere I remember this is years ago when my kids were young my oldest son we were uh, down in Illinois and we're riding on uh, biking on a, one of the trails there. And, you know, we're just talking about God, and all of a sudden, my son, I see him. He's veering off the trail, going into the grass, and just, I don't, what are you doing, Joe? He goes, well, I closed my eyes, and I was praying. I said, not while you're riding a bike. Very good lesson, important lesson. But you could talk to him anywhere, anytime. And you don't even have to use the King James English. You could talk to him just like you do. Use your Wisconsin accent, right? He understands it. Just talk to him. And you know what? He already knows what you need. You don't have to give him great detail. Lord, you need to do this. And, you know, if you work out the No, just say, Lord, you know the situation I'm in. And I don't even know what I'm going to do. Lord, I give it to you. Or just praise him. Any day, time of the day or night, Lord, what a beautiful day you've given us. What a beautiful sunset. What a beautiful sunrise. Look at your creation. Thank you for your grace and mercy. You don't have to talk to him for 20 minutes. You can just talk to him and then listen to what he's showing you. Jesus has opened the door so we can have that relationship. Don't negate it. Don't Utilize it. Go before his throne of grace and lay it before him. And then you'll be able to walk away without your shoulders being weighed down by the heavy burdens in this life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the beautiful picture in the tabernacle of Jesus. But even more importantly, thank you for Jesus. It's all about him. It's all about what he has done, is doing, and will do in our lives. He never gives up on us. Never, ever. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I can trust every word that he says. And my hope is totally in him. Thank you, Lord, for what you have given to us. And Lord, may we just go out with joy and share the love of Jesus with others. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.